Hi, this is Molly with Phoenix Children's Hospital, and we're here with another uh, Facebook live chat uh, with Dr. Cindy Bauer. She's a physician with Allergy and Immunology uh, Division at Phoenix Children's Hospital. And with Halloween less than a week away, um, you know, and food allergies always in the news, we are here to talk about food allergies, what causes them, what we can do about them. So as always, feel free to share your questions in the comments, and we will share them with Dr. Bauer as they come up. So welcome, Dr. Bauer. Thank you for having me. Um, so tell us, you know, kind of generally, what are food allergies? So a true food allergy is an adverse reaction to food that is due to a specific immune mechanism. And namely what we mean by that is it is mediated by a type of immunoglobulin known as IgE. By definition, a true food allergy can be um, recognized because it occurs every single time um, that food is ingested, and it usually occurs quite immediately after the food is consumed. And typically the symptoms are uh, consistent with what we consider to be mast cell degranulation, so maybe itchy hives, swelling of lips, tongues, ears, and in some cases shortness of breath, wheezing, vomiting. Um, so that would be a, a true IgE-mediated food allergy. But it is tricky because when it comes to food, there are a lot of adverse reactions outside of just that one specific type. Mm -hmm. and, and in that case, you're talking about lactose intolerance? Yes, okay. yes, that would be a great example. Mm -hmm. um, lactose intolerance is more of a, a metabolic, uh, non-immune mediated reaction. Uh, the symptoms are different than what I just described with a true food allergy. And again, it's due to um, an enzyme uh, issue rather than involving IgE. Um, another uh, kind of tricky one are like the eosinophilic gastrointestinal disorders, like eosinophilic esophagitis. Those uh, patients have somewhat true food allergies, but not entirely. Mm. We consider it like a mixed disorder where IgE is involved, but not entirely. Mm. Um, but yes, there are many. Celiac disease is an adverse reaction to food, but again, different mm. than the true food allergy. Mm. Um, and there's so many. It, it can be it can be quite tricky. Sure. Um, so, do we know what causes the true food allergies? Yeah, it definitely is the immunoglobulin um, E, so IgE. And what it does is, well, first of all, you're not supposed to make IgE to foods. Um, but when you do, and it binds to the allergy cells, namely like the mast cells and the basophils, what then happens is when the food is consumed in that what we call sensitized child, the receptor or this IgE binds the food and a cascade of events occur and mediators are released like histamine, leukotrienes, and symptoms of allergic reaction occur. So it's basically like your body fighting against the food that... It's unfortunately, yeah, I mean the, the body in the, in the cases of allergy uh, are recognizing benign environmental things, whether it's food or, in the case of environmental allergens, pollen, mm -hmm. and mounting a response to it, thinking it's bad, no. uh, when really we shouldn't be attacking um, the foods we eat or the environment. Sure, so, and I assume this can uh, vary from very mild to much more serious. It surely can. So in food allergy, uh, there are some that will have a very mild reaction of a couple hives, and then in others, it can be extremely severe and require an epinephrine auto-injector, or even two epinephrine auto-injector treatments. Um, the tricky thing about it, though, is the reaction you had does not predict your next reaction. Mm -hmm. So you may be a child that had a very mild reaction, and you're not as worried, which would be very, very um, scary, because the next reaction might be very severe. You sure. really don't know. Sure. So does do true food allergies, um, do they affect the gut at all? Yeah, definitely. Okay. So in, in um, you know, like I said, in most reactions, the, the cutaneous system is involved as far as hives, yeah. and edema, swelling, yeah. etc. But in some reactions, pretty much any organ system can get involved. Um, as far as the GI tract, you can see nausea, uh, vomiting, um, abdominal pain, but uh, the respiratory system can be involved with short of cough and wheezing, the cardiovascular system can become involved, neurologically one can have mm -hmm. symptoms. Um, the reactions can be extremely severe, and when that happens, and it's truly systemic like that, we call it anaphylaxis. That's what I was going to ask. So what's the difference between, you know, food allergy and anaphylaxis? Is it the same thing? It's just a it's a spectrum. So if you have a food allergy, uh, you are at risk for anaphylaxis. And like I said, you may have just had urticaria or hives um, upon first ingestion, 
and then on the next ingestion, it could be the same or it could be more severe, mm. it could be systemic, and then in that case we would call it anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis can occur to other things outside of food. Um, those with stinging insect allergy, like venom or sure. imported, imported fire ant, um, is stung in, in the susceptible uh, person, they can go into anaphylaxis and get an epinephrine auto injector. Um, medications, so drug allergy can result in anaphylaxis. Um, so yeah, it's a very, very scary reaction. Yeah. So we have uh, our first question from a viewer. Um, is there anything else other than food that can cause your throat to swell like anaphylaxis? So you mentioned the stings, things like yep, that. Yeah, stinging insect I think is a big one. Drug allergy is another one. Um, you know, if you're talking just throat swelling, there are conditions um, where people can have just what we call angioedema or swelling. Um, and in some cases, it can be hereditary. There's mm -hmm. one called hereditary angioedema, where people of any age um, can inherit a condition where they just randomly swell up, and it can last days on end, and it's quite scary. Um, there's other conditions where we don't know, and they'll just swell with no other symptoms, typically, um, and that may be just idiopathic angioedema. We can't figure out why. That must be very yeah. scary, especially <laughs> yeah. if it's lasting for several days. Yeah. I mean, what should... What happens when that happens? To you? Well, typically, um, those people see emergency medical yeah. services, yeah. Um, and the emergency providers may treat them with anything from uh, steroids, uh, and you know, obviously, epinephrine auto injector if it's felt to be allergic. Um, and depending upon the severity and the etiology, you know, we've got to secure the airway, and it, it could be theoretically possible, and it does happen in some cases where um, you know, a tracheostomy or, or um, other airway. Uh, secure, uh, the airway is secured in other methods. Mm -hmm. I don't do that in the emergency department. Yeah. I'm so grateful that my colleagues yes. that do. Yes. I follow up with you afterwards, but I don't do surgeries. <laughs> yes. Um, so another question that we got is, can you have an allergic reaction to a virus? Good question. Um, yes and no. Uh, we definitely frequently, especially in children, see the development of urticaria or hives, and in some cases swelling, which we call angioedema due to a viral infection. Mm. And in those cases, the child will be walking around with hives and swelling out of nowhere, mm -hmm. and it typically lasts days, um, you know, maybe a week to two, the kind of the duration of a virus. Mm -hmm. um, your child may have fever, and you might know they're sick at the time, sure. but usually you don't always suspect that it's the virus doing it. You think, did I give them a new food? Mm -hmm. And you may not have, in, the, in these, many of these cases you didn't. Did you get a new detergent? probably not related, mm -hmm. um, and you may think, oh, maybe it's the antibiotic we just started sure. because they're sick, and that happens all the time, yeah. and in many cases, the antibiotic was an innocent bystander. It really was the virus, so yes, viruses can kind of uh, produce the symptoms of an allergic reaction, and oftentimes, um, seeing an allergist can help you sort that mm -hmm. out, because in your situation, it's scary yeah. and totally confusing, and you want to know what it was before you just assume the virus or you assume something else. Right. Like the penicillin, you know. Uh, right, of course. Um, so another question we have is, can you have vomiting as a reaction to a dog? So I assume a dog allergy, is that sure. possible? Sure. Um, you know, typically environmental allergens, in contrast to food allergens, uh, don't cause anaphylaxis, mm. uh, which is fortunate in most cases. Uh, so you'll typically see with, you know, animal dander allergy, pollen allergy, uh, nasal symptoms or ocular symptoms like sneezing, stuffy runny nose, itchy watery eyes. Asthma can flare in some with coughing and wheezing. Uh, but again, it is quite uncommon mm -hmm. to go into a systemic allergic reaction with vomiting um, and needing an EpiPen mm -hmm. or another epinephrine mm -hmm. auto injector mm -hmm. uh, due to animal allergy. Okay. Uh, but again, I suppose it, it depends on the child and it depends on the exposure. If you were um, taking a nap in a dog's pillow, dog bed, <laughs> <laughs> anything can happen. Yeah. Sure. Um, so another one we have is, so as far as the accuracy of testing of food allergies, yeah. um, you know, blood versus skin, mm -hmm. you know, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so the diagnostics in food allergy are basically looking for that IgE mm -hmm. immunoglobulin. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, the presence of the IgE is not uh, completely in, in and of itself diagnostic. There are cases uh, where a child or adult can have IgE to the food, mm. but not clinically react. Oh, so that might be considered a false positive. So it's a little bit trickier than we'd like it to be. It really takes, um, we need to take the clinical context into consideration, 
then use appropriate testing, and then put it all together to diagnose a food allergy. But anyways, of the two available methods mm -hmm. to really assess for IgE, um, the, the skin prick testing is very nice in that it's quite quick, and you get the answers back while you're still in the office. Um, nice. The devices that we use um, typically are, are very well tolerated um, in most children, and depending upon what we're testing for, we may use um, an applicator like this where you can do multi-allergens faster, sure. um, which is a little more, I think, pediatric friendly. Mm -hmm. um, in other cases, we need to do it individually. But again, this is predominantly a plastic applicator. Um, the blood test, in contrast, is going to be your standard blood draw, and it just looks for IgE that way. I think one of the negatives that I run into is um, the results come back um, after the visit. And the families, they really, they're seeing you, um, they want to know right then and right there as much as possible before leaving. Sure. So with these applicators, are you literally putting different allergies yes. in each one? Yeah. So if you're testing for uh, environmental allergens, uh, we would place, say, cat, uh, dog, and in the cases of these allergens, it's always the, the major protein mm. um, that has been purified. Um, if it's food, it may be like a tree nut panel, it would be cashew, almond, walnut, and we would do a panel of the tree nuts if your child had a tree nut or suspected tree nut allergy. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, I know you mentioned the timing is different between blood versus skin yeah. testing, but is there any kind of accuracy difference between the two? Um, you know, they're, they're relatively comparable. I think in, in some studies it's been suggested that there's a tiny bit more uh, improved sensitivity mm -hmm. with the skin prick testing. Um, but outside of that, um, you know, there aren't a ton of differences. I, maybe cost-wise, there mm. might be a tiny bit of difference mm. as well, um, with a slightly increased cost with the um, immunocap um, blood assay. Sure. Um, and for a child who is six months um, old, mm -hmm. or maybe, you know, uh, under a year, yeah. um, what would you suggest as being better, the, the skin one? Oh, it really doesn't matter okay. the age. Um, even infants to, um, you know, older adults can have either method done. Again, we generally do skin testing um, in anyone who is a candidate. But there are some people who are not candidates. Mm -hmm. uh, a six-month-old or, you know, a 12-year-old uh, that is on an antihistamine mm -hmm. on the day of their visit, obviously we cannot skin test because that antihistamine blocks the histamine. Sure. Um, if a child has severe eczema and the skin isn't clear, then we, we can't do this to the skin because there's rash everywhere. So sure. it, it always you have to take the child and the scenario into account before making the decision. Mm -hmm. And so when you give those skin tests, um, I assume that the one that is the culprit shows up yeah. big on, on yeah. I what usually, does it look like? I usually tell parents that it's going to look like a mosquito bite oh. and feel like one too. It's sure. very, very, very itchy. Okay. Uh, but yes, there'll be a, an area of red swelling and sometimes surrounding that little bump is a, a little area of erythema. Mm -hmm. And we measure that mm -hmm. um, and use that information to, again, confirm the, the diagnosis and then follow it. Mm -hmm. um, depending upon what we're following with food, it may be um, an annual thing that we check okay. and hope that it gets smaller. Sure, <laughs> sure. But it's not at all dangerous to put the actual allergen in. Typically not. Uh, surely in the medical literature, systemic reactions have been reported to mm -hmm. skin testing, but they are extremely rare. And you're in the hospital already, so that's right. Good, right? <laughs> um, so another question we got was, what's the easiest way to check for throat or tongue swelling in a baby? Um, would larger cheeks, larger, larger neck, you know, sort of the grunting noises help you make a decision? Yeah, you know, if a child is grunting and in any distress, um, I would be calling 911 mm -hmm. and getting emergency mm -hmm. medical services. The airway is just not anything you want to mess around with. Mm -hmm. So if a child seems to be distressed and having difficulty breathing, mm -hmm. um, call 911. And then in the meantime, if you want to attempt to make an assessment, you know, obviously we use tongue depressors and try to get the tongue down and look around, open out. Um, but it's not easy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's a stressful situation, yes, it too. Is. You know, and with babies, you know, they can't talk about no. what's wrong. So, you know, how do you, as a parent, yeah, do That's what I said. If they're fussy, if yeah. they appear to be uh, in respiratory distress, if there's any cyanosis or blueness that mm -hmm. you might see, um, you, you need help. Sure. And particularly if you, if these symptoms are following an allergen exposure, like if this was the second time you gave them peanut butter mm -hmm. and they're doing this, then there's no questions asked. Or if they just got stung by a bee and they have hives and they're doing this. 
So again, you put it all together, mm -hmm. um, but in an allergic reaction, mm -hmm. um, it, it can be fatal. Yeah. So <laughs> you, yes. you need to take it seriously. Yes, very much. Um, uh, and if a blood test is positive, but the skin is negative, or vice versa, mm -hmm. um, is one more accurate than the other? Again, we really, we really use all information when we make a clinical decision. And if there ever is a time where um, the two methods are in disagreement or we're not certain, we then consider our gold standard. And the gold standard to diagnose a food allergy is what we call an oral food challenge. Mm -hmm. We give the child the food. Mm -hmm. We do it in a very safe setting in the allergy clinic um, with increasing doses of the food spaced out over time, mm -hmm. examining, checking vital signs between each ingestion of the food to make sure that they're safe. And sometimes it, it, it's not uncommon to have a, a positive skin test, especially if it's not that positive, or a slightly elevated blood test, but again, not through the roof, and the child passes. Mm -hmm. That's why food allergy is really tough, mm -hmm. is again, these tests don't always agree, mm -hmm. as mentioned, and they can still be positive and not clinically relevant. Sure, and that's what I was going to ask too. You mm -hmm. mentioned false positives. I mean, does yeah. that happen very often? It does happen, especially if the test is done uh, to a food that the child is eating. Mm -hmm. So ideally, uh, allergy testing shouldn't be done to a food that a, that a child is eating without a reaction to. Mm -hmm. It really is meant to be used to investigate foods that are s suspicious mm -hmm. for being true food allergies in that they caused any of the symptoms I mentioned immediately after ingestion, particularly if it's a repeatable thing. Sure. So, you know, we mentioned earlier that Halloween is next Monday. Yeah. It's exciting. Um, and it, can you talk a little bit about how children with food allergies can maybe approach trick-or-treating? Yeah. I think, you know, it really depends upon their parents. Um, the children are excited and they want to have fun. And if you're prepared, I think you can make it a wonderful and safe experience for the child. Uh, there are a lot of options that parents can uh, pursue. One option would be to, uh, you know, approach your neighbors with goodie bags and say, when my child comes to your door, would you mind giving them these stickers or uh, this treat, something that you know is safe. That way, you can be relaxed to a degree <laughs> that night when you're out, knowing that you have safe homes that are designated. Mm -hmm. Another option is, especially with, you know, children that are understanding and willing to work with you is to have an exchange policy where no candy is consumed during trick-or-treating unless it's a candy you bring and give to them. But at the end of the night, you swap out candy with candy that they can have. So mom might take the Reese's peanut butter cup and the child gets a starburst and we're in exchange mm. so that they can still experience it, they can get the candy, but of course they only consume things that are, are safe or non-food items are great too. Sure. Um, the, the Teal Pumpkin Campaign that mm -hmm. FAIR, the Food Allergy and Research and Education um, National Campaign has um, been promoting is also a great way to recognize those homes that are likely to be safe to bring your child to. Those homes may be giving out all non-food items or they may have two reserves where they have some candies but they also have something else that's allergy friendly. And definitely if your child has food allergies or food sensitivities, uh, those, that's a home that, that I would go to. Uh, for some, you know, Trick-or-treating just isn't an option, mm -hmm. and, and that's okay, too. Mm -hmm. Children can either stay home and hand out the candy, or you don't have to participate at all. You can have a little Halloween party at your home and just do your own movie-watching, um, snack-eating, you know, event. Sure. Um, so another question we got is, can immunodeficiency cause an allergy? No, not specifically. So primary immune deficiencies uh, are where your immune system is typically missing a piece, and uh, people with immune deficiencies often have recurrent infections um, and a spectrum of other symptoms depending upon which immune deficiency. There are a handful of immune deficiencies where they also have allergy, mm -hmm. whether it's severe eczema, multiple food allergies, but I wouldn't say that it's the immune deficiency that's typically causing it. Again, the cause of food allergy is going to be the, the making of IgE that binds the allergy cells and then causes that cascade of um, events to occur when the food is consumed. But they are they are related mm. in a very complex sort of way. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you've mentioned a few different types of food allergies. What are the most common food allergies? Yeah, so about 90% of food allergies are to one of six foods. Uh, cow's milk, mm. peanut, soy, egg, uh, wheat, and fish. Oh, and tree nuts. I guess I should lump all nuts together, yeah. even though peanuts are definitely separate than the tree nuts, but yeah, nuts as a whole. Those are the, the major big sixes, I like to think of them. Interesting. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so what are some of the symptoms we mentioned? Throat swelling, mm -hmm. hives, things like that. Is there, are there any, you know, other specialized symptoms that might show up with an allergy? Um, you know, I think the biggest one that parents need to know is the cutaneous symptoms because 90% of the time an allergic reaction is going to have those. And they're most visible. Probably. Yeah, they're really visible. Yeah. You should have quite obvious hives, um, itching, um, and then if, if angioedema or swelling is involved, again, that should be very visible. Um, there are some food intolerances, though, mm. or food sensitivities mm -hmm. that can cause rash, too. So that's why it's important to speak to a healthcare provider mm -hmm. when a rash has occurred. An example would be strawberry. Uh, strawberry, along with tomato and pineapple and a few other foods, are really commonly uh, associated with uh, redness, uh, especially in the perioral region, uh, but it can be of the whole face. Mm. Um, and it's not IgE-mediated. It's actually not a true food allergy. It's a sensitivity to the food because certain foods cause our body to release more histamine. Other foods, like dried fruits, actually just contain a lot of histamine. And if, in certain people, if they eat that, they're just more sensitive to it. And they'll have a reaction that kind of looks like an allergic reaction. But you need to talk to your provider so you know what you're dealing with. Because obviously, the prognosis is quite different if it's a true food allergy versus a food sensitivity. Mm -hmm. So. Are food allergies mostly genetic? Yeah, so allergy in general is kind of thought to be a combination of a genetic plus environmental influences. It's, it's actually quite complicated, but the example I give is that, you know, a mom and dad that have a child with a food allergy, if they have their baby on a farm in rural Poland, so same genetics, mm -hmm. but completely different mm -hmm. environment, there's a good chance the child may not. It's different. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's complex, and I don't know that we totally know what causes food allergy. There's a mm -hmm. lot of things that are involved, but most simply, it is genetic, but also the environment is very important. Sure. Uh, is there a chance that a child will grow out? Definitely. Allergies? And that's my favorite thing about my specialty, is seeing a child um, become tolerant to a food with time. So we repeat the allergy testing often every, you know, depending on the food, every mm -hmm. year to two. Um, for cow's milk, soy, egg, and wheat, we are really expecting the child to outgrow it because there's about an 80% chance that by the age of 16 they will. Mm. And so each year we're checking and seeing if it's, uh, if it's showing signs of that and hopefully one day bringing the child to food challenge. Um, in the case of nuts as well as fish, it's not so great. Uh, we may check every year or so, uh, but the optimism isn't quite there. The chance of a peanut allergy being outgrown is only 20%. For tree nut allergy, it's about 10%. And for fish, it's close to zero. <laughs> so, um, is there anything that parents can do to help their child outgrow it? I mean, you know, good question. Un unfortunately, the you know once you have a food allergy, the treatment um, really consists of avoidance. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing that we have found, though, is in the setting of milk and egg. Once the child is found to be likely tolerant to baked egg mm -hmm. or baked milk. Routinely giving the child that form of the food actually does help expedite uh, their acquisition of tolerance or becoming not allergic. Um, so that's that's a fun intervention that we can have that makes that process go even more quickly. Interesting. So let's say my child has an allergy. I know that they're about to go to school. Um, how do I find out if my child's school has an EpiPen or what I do to make sure that they are safe? So first of all, you should have your own two-pack of EpiPens. The, the EpiPens always come in a two-pack because mm -hmm. there is a, depending upon the study, uh, about 20% chance, we'll say, of needing the second EpiPen. Mm -hmm. So the two-pack uh, should be prescribed to you, mm -hmm. and you should have one for the school, and you should have your own as well. So two two-packs. Mm -hmm. Now, if you didn't know your child had a food allergy, um, the school might also have EpiPens stocked for your child in the event unbeknown to you, mm -hmm. uh, your child, say, gets stung by a bee and has anaphylaxis, mm -hmm. and you didn't have an EpiPen for them. And that is because there is an Arizona state law that's in place that allows schools to stock uh, two packs of the EpiPen Junior um, and then two, a two pack of the EpiPen you know, regular mm -hmm. uh, or other epinephrine auto ejector, but I think the EpiPen brand is the one most commonly used. And those EpiPens um, are in the school because we know a about up to 25% of anaphylaxis that occurs in school occurs to children who didn't, or children or adults, who didn't know they had an allergy. Mm -hmm. So for that reason, the schools can have it. Mm -hmm. So the best way to find out is to simply you know, seek out your 
um, you know, school nurse or other health care provider in the school and ask, do you stack EpiPens here? Mm -hmm. um, and typically the school should be trained if they do, and they're there for not only a student that is found to have anaphylaxis, but actually for the staff too. Sure, sure, just in case. It's, it's a great safety measure, and yeah. it's great that our state has this. Yeah. I hope all schools are able to take advantage of yeah. having the EpiPens. Yeah. Um, so, can children literally be born day one and, and start showing signs of? It, it depends on the food allergy, on the food, really. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it usually occurs within the first couple of exposures. Mm -hmm. And there are children, particularly those with eczema, who actually get sensitized to the food through their skin. Mm -hmm. And in those cases, it can actually occur on the first ingestion of the food. So, in an infant, um, if a child is not breastfed and is instead offered um, like a cow's milk based formula, um, it is quite possible to develop allergy very, very early in life. But typically, I would say um, it doesn't happen right away. We usually see it kind of later on when food introductions are, are started. Sure. Um, so, we have another question. If my child gets bumpy, itchy skin, should they get tested for a food allergy? So it depends. If the bumpy, itchy skin is consistent with atopic dermatitis or eczema, there is a tiny chance that food is involved, but it's not great. Mm -hmm. um, at most, we, we know that about 30% of children with severe eczema may have a food trigger. Mm -hmm. So typically, I think if your child has um, eczema and is doing well, um, I wouldn't manipulate their diet. But you certainly can talk to your healthcare provider about it and see if there is any need to consider it. If the bumpy, itchy skin is hives, well, that's a little different. And if it's immediately after a food ingestion and it is repeatable, well, yes, then that's a food allergy and you should totally see mm -hmm. someone to have that further investigated. Sure. So if a child, you know, whether through the emergency room finds out they have an allergy or just parent notices some, you know, right, bumpy, itchy skin, <laughs> um, and they come to you, uh, what happens in the allergy clinic? So we definitely start by taking an extremely detailed history. We want to know uh, what food was provided, how much did the child eat, how quickly did the symptoms occur, what were the symptoms, what treatment was given. Um, we also want to know the family history, of course, because again, we talked about there being a small genetic component. Once we have all that information, we have um, like a pretest probability in our mind of how likely we think this is to be food allergy. And we also probably, hopefully, have a, a culprit in mind. And that is the culprit we then test to, to confirm. The positive predictive value of a test is very high. So if the test is high and my pretest probability was high, I have a very strong suspicion of you know, making the diagnosis. But if the pretest probability was low and the skin test was, you know, say, negative, you know, it can get tricky. Mm -hmm. And we may need to do more investigating at that point. Sure. Um, and is there anything that parents can do you know, I think I've heard of things like eating peanut butter when you're pregnant or yeah. breastfeeding. I mean, are there things parents can do when children are younger yeah. in pregnancy? So the prevention of food allergy is um, a really hot area right now. Mm -hmm. um, the last set of guidelines that the American Academy of Pediatrics came out with in about 2008 were really vague, and they just said that kind of we don't really have enough clear data sure. to recommend um, avoiding foods or consuming foods, mm -hmm. anything about food, to pregnant mothers nor breastfeeding mothers. So the recommendations were to kind of just do whatever you normally do, <laughs> whether you eat peanut butter or don't eat peanut butter. Um, and then, you know, they also kind of said in a, in a typical child that's not considered high risk to introduce foods starting around age four to six months and to not delay the introduction of the highly allergenic foods, which is very vague. It doesn't give you mm -hmm. set times. And because of that vagueness, many families you know, they still started around four to six months, but they never quite got to peanut butter or egg or shrimp. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I think we're hopeful that new guidelines can come out, as will new studies, because there has been data, especially with the LEAP trial, learning early about peanut allergy, which came out last year in the New England Journal of Medicine, that perhaps early introduction might be better. Mm. And might, especially in, in the, that study in high-risk infants, actually help prevent them from developing the food allergy. So more will come, but right now, you know, talk to your pediatrician um, or speak to an allergist about the timing of introduction and what might be best for your child. Sure. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we are sure that you have many more questions, so feel free to put those in our comments. We'll share them with Dr. Bauer. Also, we'll share some links to the Teal Pumpkin Project and some of the other things we talked about today. Thank you so much for joining us. And one other thing, if you have any ideas for topics you'd like to hear about, 
um, from future Facebook live chats. Um, feel free to put those in the comments as well. Thanks so much for listening.